the Federal Reserve is trying to crash the stock market. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the dilemma that is facing the Federal Reserve and the current administration. But before we get into this, let's hear from an actual Fed insider who is responsible for executing the last round of quantitative tightening. Editor, let's cut to the clip. I'm just, no, I just see the market really having a, a taper tantrum, to, for lack of a better term, if they get to QT. I think an epic taper tantrum might even be part of the plan if you think asset prices might be too high. That was my good buddy, Fed insider, Joseph Wang. He was actually working on the New York Fed's trading desk, executing the last round of quantitative tightening. So if anybody understands what's going on at the Fed, it's going to be Joseph. And if you didn't catch what he was saying, he said the Fed might actually want a taper tantrum because they think asset prices are too high. In other words, the Fed might just try to create a stock market crash, just like we saw during the last taper tantrum in 2018. So why is this? Because they're in a big dilemma right now, like we were saying before. Let's start by looking at a chart of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, as measured by the government. <laughs> and I always say that because you and I both know that this wildly understates the real inflation, the prices that you guys are paying every single day. But this chart goes back to 2002 all the way to today's date. On the left, we go from negative 5% up to 10%. Ah, I forgot to put the percentage little signs there, but you guys get it. You're good to go. So it starts off around maybe 2% in 2002, then it kind of up and down and up and down between maybe 1%, 2%, and 5%. Then we have the GFC, and the bottom falls out of the market, the real estate market, the stock market, and prices actually go down. We experience deflation. Again, this is according to the government. I would assume that in the real economy, prices really didn't go negative. They were still rising, but rising at a lower rate. This is about 2010. And then we have the quote unquote recovery because of the Fed and the quantitative easing, operation twist, QE1, 2, 3, et cetera, and a massive amount of government deficit spending. But we saw disinflation, that inflation peaks out around 2011 then goes down, 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 down. This doesn't necessarily mean we had deflation. Prices weren't going down, but the rate of increase was slowing substantially. Pops up here slightly in 2016, and then during the Cerveza sickness, it really goes down back to around 0%. But then the Fed comes out, drops interest rates to zero, announces QE infinity, and commits to doing up to a trillion dollars a day in the repo market. But even more importantly, the government comes out with the first CARES Act. Notice I said it was the first, because I do not think it will be the last. But they deficit spend like a drunken sailor, like only your drunk, insolvent Uncle Sam can, <laughs> to the two to four, five trillion dollars in 2020 and 2021. And this, along with the economic distortions created by the government's response to the Cerveza sickness, it was not the Cerveza sickness. I always say it was the government's response to the Cerveza sickness, locking you in a cage, forcing small and mid-sized businesses to go bust, creating a labor shortage, etc. This is why when you go to the grocery store right now, a lot of the shelves are barren. So if you increase demand with stimmy checks, PPP, and government deficit spending, and you decrease supply, what happens to prices? They absolutely skyrocket. Now the most recent headline CPI print is 7%. But in order to really get our heads around what's happening with consumer price inflation right now, we've got to get into the details. 
This is a very nuanced subject. We know that prices are going up, but really what prices are going up and to what degree? To figure that out, editor, let's go right back to the internet. This is from the BLS's website, bls.org, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Most recent inflation data, 12-month percentage change, consumer price index, and this is broken down by categories. This is very interesting. So all items, 7%, like we said back at the whiteboard video. But food, we've got overall 6.3, but that's broken down into 6.5 for food at home. You can see the meats have really gone up 12.5. Dairy, not so much, but everything's right around 5, 6%. Food away from home, 6%. Full service meals, 6.6. Limited service meals and snacks, 8%. Now, energy gone up by 29%. Energy commodities, 48%. Okay, so basically this is oil and gas has really skyrocketed, almost 50%. Energy services have gone up by a little less. Electricity, 6.3, uh, 24% for nat gas. And I would assume because a lot of it's being exported to Europe, uh, their nat gas prices have absolutely soared to the point where it's an issue of national security, especially in places like Germany. A lot of people cannot afford to heat their homes right now. So all items less food and energy. So this would be core CPI at 5.5%. This is the metric the Fed really pays a lot of attention to, according to what they say. So commodities, less food and energy. Commodities, 10.7%. Apparel, 5.8%. Um, new vehicles, 11%. Used cars, 37%. <laughs> Jeez, man. Medical care, just 0.4%. That's probably the lowest price increase on the overall list. Uh, tobacco, 9%. Doesn't affect really a lot of people. But you can see everything down below the tobacco is about 3 or 4%. So the whole point in going over this list in great detail, these are the things that the average Joe and Jane buys on a daily basis. So regardless of what the headline CPI is, they don't get into the nitty gritty of the BLS and all the, they don't geek out on the macro stuff that we do. All they know is that the prices of the stuff they buy daily is going up and they don't like it. So people in the real economy, like the average Joe, Moody the Millennial, and even your friend and family member, Fred, this is the gentleman who loves the Federal Reserve. He loves central planners. Even he is getting pissed off at the high prices that he's paying at the grocery store. So they send a message to Biden directly. It goes something like this. Let's go Brandon. Not quite sure what that means, but I think that it means they're pissed off and they don't like what the administration is doing. <laughs> and I think the administration hears the message loud and clear. Now, if you guys were paying attention to Twitter or the news last night, you saw Joe Biden got caught with a hot mic, said something that was rather embarrassing. And it's not the fact that he used profanity or he called one of the reporters well, we'll get to the clip in a moment here. I want to keep it kid-friendly. And what that detailed list of the CPI illustrates is that prices going up to this degree, when the average Joe and Jane is noticing it, this is political kryptonite. And going into the midterms, the probability that the Democrats get reelected if prices are at these levels or continuing to go up is very, very low. But just so you guys get a glimpse of what happened, all the drama last night in the news and on Twitter, editor, let's cut to the clip. Will you take President Biden's place in that? Do you think your place is a political liability? That's a great asset. More inflation. What a stupid son of a bitch. So again, to me, this is a tell the administration's number one priority is get inflation under control. So you can imagine what happens. The phone call 
between Joe Biden and his buddy right here, Jerome Powell. Most likely, Joe Biden is not happy. He's sitting here clenching his fist and he's saying, listen, you I need to win. The Democrats need to stay in power. So do your job and get inflation under control. The next question becomes, what does Jerome Powell do? What's his game plan? I think he looks around him and sees all of the asset bubbles, the everything bubble, if you will, and focuses on the purchasing power for the average Americans in the stock market. And he says to himself, if I can decrease that purchasing power, that decreases aggregate demand. This is a phrase that Keynesians use all the time. So if I can decrease aggregate demand, then I can bring down the rate of inflation and Biden won't be as pissed off at me and he won't call me a stupid SOB. <laughs> so it's the easiest way for him to bring down aggregate demand. It's to intentionally create a stock market crash. Step number two. Now let's go over Jerome Powell's game plan to bring down the rate of inflation, which most likely would bring down the stock market as well. So we've all heard this, but I want to get into the nuance of what's going on because on this channel, we try to entertain, we try to inform, but I also try to educate. So tapering, this is just when the Fed is reducing the amount of quantitative easing. They announced this on November 3rd. I want to point out the market is down significantly since they announced tapering. Editor, let's go ahead and throw up the chart. And again, they announced tapering around November 3rd. They started tapering in the middle of November. And you can see that we have gone up, down, but right now, especially over the last few days, we are down substantially since they announced tapering in the beginning of November. I also want to point out that we are experiencing huge volatility in the market right now. Yesterday, it was down 1,100 points and it came <laughs> roaring back up 100. And I checked today, started off down 700. As we speak, it's down 300. So obviously the stock market doesn't like the Fed tapering at all. But unfortunately, there is more because we haven't even talked about the Fed raising rates. That's the next step once they get the quantitative easing down to zero. So most of you understand raising rates they just increase IOR, which is interest on reserves. And this brings up the Fed funds rate. But what most people don't understand is that now banks really aren't competing for customer deposits. So that's just a fancy way of saying that pretty much 100% of the additional interest that the Fed will be paying the banks will go right to their bottom line. It will be profit. So going back to my discussion with Joseph Wang, he believes that the banks will take most of those profits that they're getting. I've got it in a red dollar sign here because remember, they are bank reserves denominated in dollars, not really dollars that circulate in the real economy, but still profits for the bank. And they'll take those profits, they'll want to buy treasuries because although there's a negative real yield, it's still better than holding cash. Well, assuming the Fed isn't going to be issuing many more treasuries because of inflation, debt ceiling, etc. Where can they buy the treasuries they need? Well, from the non-bank entities in the real economy. We've got it represented right here by the average Joe. So this is the individuals and the businesses, the corporations in the real economy. So what happens is the bank takes the additional profit, gives it to the average Joe, the average Joe or the non-bank entity in the real economy, sells the treasury to the bank. What happens to the amount of dollars that are circulating in the real economy because of this transaction, the amount of dollars increases. So this could, it could possibly add another cross current or another tailwind to consumer price inflation, although rising interest rates would be a headwind to asset prices. 
Like we always say, there's tons of these cross currents happening at all times, and we've got to pay close attention to all of them to make sure that we are making prudent financial decisions for the future. Now let's move on to quantitative tightening. And most of you know how this works. The Fed basically sells the treasuries or mortgage-backed securities off their balance sheet. This reduces the liquidity or the amount of bank reserves or the bank's balance sheet capacity to lend in other areas, such as the repo market. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of the repo market. We'll save that for another video. But most people get this concept. Quantitative easing, increasing the size of the Fed's balance sheet. Quantitative tightening, decreasing the size of the Fed's balance sheet. But after speaking to Joseph Wang, go back to that conversation one more time, Joseph says they really don't sell the treasuries or the mortgage-backed securities back to the banks. They just let them roll off their balance sheet. So the net result is still the same, but I want to walk through the process just so you, the rebel capitalist viewers, understand the nuance. We start with the Fed's balance sheet, the bank's balance sheet, and the Treasury's balance sheet. Assets on the left, liabilities on the right. And the Fed starts with Treasuries and bank reserves. Those bank reserves are assets of the bank. And of course, this Treasury is a liability of the Treasury itself. We'll say Janet Yellen. What happens when the Fed allows these Treasuries to roll off their balance sheet is let's say this treasury is maturing tomorrow. So Janet Yellen would need to pay the Fed back. Well, she doesn't have any money in the TGA, so she has to issue another treasury to pay back the Fed. So she issues another treasury. So who buys the treasury? It would be the bank, because remember the Fed's not in the game anymore. They're trying to reduce the size of their balance sheet. So after this transaction, here's how the balance sheets would work. The treasury would now have two treasuries as liabilities on their balance sheet. They would have the bank reserves because the bank paid them for the treasury. So what would happen on the Fed's balance sheet is they still would have the original treasury, but the bank reserves would just move from the account of the bank that was held at the Federal Reserve to the TGA because the bank's checking deposit account, if you want to look at it that way, is a liability of the Fed, just like your checking account is a liability of Wells Fargo or B of A. And the TGA, which is the Treasury's checking account, is also a liability of the Fed. So basically, they just move the bank reserves from the bank's account down into the Treasury's account. Then the last step of the process is Janet Yellen pays, let's say Jerome Powell, the money that she owes him, because remember this treasury is maturing. So Jerome Powell just reduces the amount of bank reserves that he owes Janet Yellen. So therefore the treasury is gone, the bank reserves are gone, the treasury still owes the last treasury that was created or sold at act auction that was purchased by the bank. And just to be clear, I want to reiterate that regardless of whether the Fed just sells the treasuries to the banking system, or if they just let them roll off their balance sheet, they let them mature, and the Fed pays them back, the net result is still the same. But I just wanted to go over the nuance because again, this channel is all about informing, entertaining, and educating you. Oh, time out. I know a lot of you watching this video right now that are really, really paying attention. You're saying, wait a minute, George, if the Fed has a treasury or a mortgage-backed security on their balance sheet that's yielding 1% and interest rates go up to 2%, that means they're going to be selling that treasury at a loss. Now, this is assuming that they did quantitative tightening by selling the treasuries prior to maturing. And if the Federal Reserve has a realized loss, who's holding the bag? You guessed it, the taxpayer. And how that would work is the remittances that usually go to the treasury from the Fed 
for the interest that they are receiving or any money that they make will be reduced by the realized loss from selling the treasury or mortgage-backed security in the first place. So now you say, okay, George, well, they're not selling those treasuries or mortgage-backed securities into the market right now. Let's assume they roll them off the balance sheet. So maybe that's different. Okay, but what you're forgetting there is that when Janet Yellen issues that new treasury to pay off the old treasury that's maturing, she's going to have to pay a higher interest rate. And therefore, that higher interest rate will have to be absorbed by the taxpayer. So regardless of the specifics, the net result is still the same. The taxpayers are getting screwed. Step number three, the problem. If Jerome Powell continues with the tapering, the quantitative tightening, the raising interest rates, we could see the market go down slowly, but we could see it go down in a disorderly fashion like we saw in March of 2020. This would not only be a huge problem for Jerome Powell, but it would also be a huge problem for the real economy. More on that in just a moment. Now, what's the big problem for Biden? You can see here, I drew him. He looks a little bit like heroin guy. <laughs> but Biden is from the streets of Washington, D.C. instead of the streets of San Francisco. But I think the damage has been done. And here's what I mean by that. If we go back to this chart of consumer price inflation as measured by the government, we can see that since 2008 or so, we've been in this gradual disinflation. Inflation may be running at 1%, 2%. Prices were going up, but they're going up very, very slowly. And it goes back to that idea of boiling the frog very slowly. He doesn't even know that he's being boiled until it's too late. And I think it's the same thing with consumer prices. People really don't notice if they go up at a very, very slow rate. But if they go parabolic in the last year, if prices go up by 20%, 30%, 40%, consumers not only notice, but they get angry. So let's think this through. Even if Jerome Powell is able to tame inflation, I don't think he's going to be able to create deflation. In other words, the prices that you pay for beef, rent, daycare, really the stuff you buy daily, those prices will never go back down to where they were in 2019. Even if we get 0% inflation moving forward, they will just plateau at this new extremely high level. And although wages might creep up, they don't go up at the same rate nor do they go up to the same level. So the purchasing power, the average Joe and Jane, declines substantially. You've got to put yourself in that mindset for a moment. Let's say that you were paying $5 a pound for beef, and now you're paying $10 a pound. Fast forward six months when we get to the midterm elections, and are you going to say, oh, well, I'll go ahead and give those Democrats a break because I haven't seen the price of beef go up substantially in the last six months? Absolutely not. Every single time you go to the grocery store, you're going to buy that beef at $10, and it's going to remind you of the fact that two years ago or a year and a half ago, you could have bought that at $5. It's fresh in your memory, and it's still going to make the average voter angry even if prices don't continue to go up at the same pace. That's why I've got Biden here looking like heroin guy, because I think the damage is done. I think inflation has already delivered him and the rest of the Democrats that knockout blow. Now let's go back to Jerome Powell and the problem that he's facing. Like we said earlier, he's worried about a disorderly crash in the stock market. So what he wants is the stock market to go down very slowly, just like this. Again, it's kind of like prices going up very slowly. We're just boiling the frog gradually so it doesn't notice and hop out of the pot. So let's assume he is able to stick this landing 
and the stock market just goes down by 20%, maybe over the next year or year and a half. I think this would actually achieve their objectives. So the way I'm thinking this through is I believe that the labor force participation rate being so low right now has a lot to do with asset prices, cryptocurrency, and the stock market being so high. So if we assume the stock market goes down gradually over the next year and a half by 20%, I think the labor force participation would increase. Therefore, we could go from a labor shortage to a labor surplus. This is a huge input cost that goes into the prices that you pay for the stuff you buy daily. Let me be clear. I think the supply shortages and the supply chain disruptions that you have been seeing lately will be with us for quite some time. They were caused by government intervention distorting the economy. And if I had to make a prediction, I would say that the government distortions will be greater in the future and not less in the future. But that component of labor is a very, very big deal. The government can't screw that up the same way that they can screw up the supply chains. So again, if we have the labor increasing or the amount of labor available increasing, we most likely would see disinflation. And again, I'm not saying that you'll see prices go down, you just might see them go up at a slower pace. But if the 20% downturn in the stock market looks more like this chart, <laughs> looks like something you'd see in a Wile E. Coyote Roadrunner cartoon. <laughs> then it's a whole different story because now it's going to impact the overall economy to a huge degree because I think the economy, the real economy, is really built and dependent on the monetary heroin it receives from asset prices being at all-time highs. So I think the economy could gradually adjust if you see this chart, but it's going to get a knockout blow, just like Biden and the Democrats, if the chart looks more like this. Then it puts Jerome Powell and the administration in a very difficult position. They've really got two choices. You either support the stock market, you have the Fed put or the government put, and then inflation be damned, or you stay focused on controlling inflation and the stock market in the real economy collapse. I think this meme that I saw on Twitter yesterday sums it up perfectly. On the left, you can choose continuing the game plan of tapering, interest rate hikes, and quantitative easing, but stomps crash. Or on the right, you could choose to go back to the money printing, which might prop up the stock market, but then it takes us on the road to becoming a Marizuela. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.